Porsche today is synonymous with fast cars, big price tags, and let's be honest, midlife crises. But the company that we know today has had a long and colorful history since it was first founded as a small engineering design firm in interwar Germany. Porsche is a company that should not exist today. During its 91-year history, it has been on the brink of shutdown more times than it would publicly like to admit. The secret to its resilience has been its unparalleled ability to adapt and make the most out of the opportunities it has to work with. Today, when you think of Porsche, you might only think of sports cars, but that was never even the initial intention of the company. It's not the only thing they make, and for those of you who come from How Money Works, you will know that it's not even their primary business anymore. So it's time to learn how history works, to learn about all the times that Porsche should have been shut down, and how it survived to become the company that it is today. Porsche was founded in 1931 in Stuttgart, Germany, by three men, Ferdinand Porsche, his son-in-law, Anton Pieck, and Adolf Rosenberger. 1931 was not a good time to start a car company in what was then Weimar, Germany. The Great Depression was in full swing all around the world, and Germany was feeling the full brunt of its effect because not only did it have to deal with the financial difficulties of the worst economic downturn ever, it also had to pay onerous war reparations to the victors of World War I. Porsche and Pieck were both very smart men. They were both doctors in their respective fields. Porsche in engineering and Pieck in law. But they didn't have the funding needed to start a business at such a tumultuous time in Germany. That's where the often forgotten third founder of Porsche came in. Adolf Rosenberger was a successful businessman that provided the starting capital to get the company off the ground. The company was founded as Dr. Ing HCF Porsche AG, which translates to Doctor of Engineering Honorary Degree Ferdinand Porsche Company. This naming convention is very similar to what you might see today with law firms that display their partners' names and credentials. Porsche settled on such an uncatchy name because the company never originally intended to sell cars. The business was set up as an engineering consulting firm which would provide advice to other car companies like Mercedes and the newly formed Auto Union, a collection of four German vehicle manufacturers known better today as Audi. Ferdinand was still very proud of his engineering consulting firm and what it was doing for the city it operated in. He created a logo out of a combination of two coat of arms of the region of Württemberg and the city of Stuttgart, a logo that is still used today and has outlived the region it drew its inspiration from. For the next five years, the trio would run a moderately successful business and build a good name for themselves, as the automotive consultants to the big German players. These operations changed drastically by 1935, with a change of government that would both cement Porsche as a household name while destroying the soul of the business in the process. Two years into the company's operations, the Nazi party led by Adolf Hitler had risen to power, and two years after that, Adolf Rosenberg, one of the three founders and a Jew, was arrested and imprisoned for no other reason than his faith. Ferdinand and Anton carried on despite this setback, and in a cruel twist of irony, went on to secure the most important contract the company had received from the same regime that had imprisoned their business partner. In 1937, the German labor front founded the Volkswagen Group, and set out to make a car that anybody could afford to be driven on all the new highways the government was busy building at the time. Volkswagen was a new company with no experience building cars at that point, so an open tender was put out to all of the car manufacturers in Germany to design the car of the people. As luck would have it, Porsche's scrappy young engineering firm would beat out the much more established automakers like Mercedes, BMW, and Audi. The Volkswagen Beetle was designed by Porsche to be able to carry two people at 60 miles per hour and cost less than 1,000 Reichsmarks. For the sake of comparison, even the cheapest vehicles produced by the other German automakers at the time cost a minimum of 10,000 Reichsmarks. The Beetle was such a brilliant design that despite its limited specs, 1930s technology, and questionable origin story, it was built 21 million times and only went out of production in 2003. Three years after the rollout of the People's Car, World War II broke out, and Porsche's now significant operations were redirected towards making military equipment for the German war effort. Porsche redesigned the Beetle to operate as a super light troop transport vehicle, the Kubelwagen, and even pushed the design to create an amphibious version of the car that could drive on both land and water called the Schwimmwagen. Porsche's company took on a series of more ambitious projects while also taking on more responsibilities overseeing the operations of the Volkswagen plants. In 1942, Porsche released its first hybrid vehicle, but this wasn't some tree-hugging economy car designed to save the planet. It was actually the exact opposite. It was a tank. Porsche developed a prototype Tiger tank to bid for the government's contract to build a ground vehicle that would win the war. 
the Porsche Tiger utilized a diesel engine in conjunction with two electric motors to power the 70-ton death machine. Porsche's design would end up losing out to the more traditional design submitted by the Panzer company. But next time you see someone in a hybrid Cayenne, you will know where that design traces its origins back to. At the end of the war, the Porsche factories in Stuttgart and the Volkswagen factories in Wolfsburg were captured by Allied forces, and so too was Ferdinand, Anton, and Ferdinand's son, Ferry. They were charged as criminals for utilizing forced labor in their factories and sentenced to 22 months in a French prison. This was a particularly light sentence, especially since Pieck was a non-military member of the SS. They got away with such a light approach partially because witnesses from the plants commented on their comparatively humane treatment. This included testimony from their old business partner Adolf Rosenberger, who had been able to flee Germany, eventually ending up as an American citizen living in California. The Allies also now had more urgent problems to deal with. Porsche and Volkswagen were both companies that prospered under and were run for the benefit of the Nazi state. Under any other circumstance, they would cease to exist and their factories would be stripped for parts. But they were allowed to survive because the Allies wanted Germany back on its feet as quickly as possible. The country was being divided into East and West, with the Soviets very quickly becoming the new common enemy. The best way that the non-Soviet Allies saw to stop the spread of communism in Europe was to create an environment where business and industry could prosper under a capitalist system. Starting new companies from scratch would be slow and inefficient, so a decision was made to allow companies like Volkswagen and Porsche to maintain the civilian side of their business operations. For Porsche, this was still a big blow, because for the company's entire history, it had mostly lived off of contracts from the German state. The company shrank significantly, but it started to take the shape of the car maker we know today. The company traded in its mega factories in Stuttgart for a sawmill in Austria. But in that shed, Ferdinand and his son Ferry designed the first ever Porsche sports car, the 356. The 356 was pretty much just a modified Beetle. It used the same tiny engine and had a lot of the same internal components. The difference was that the car would be made out of aluminum, so it was very light, which gave it great performance around small European roads. Ferry went door-to-door -door meeting with German auto dealers, begging them to offer his new sports car to their customers. Once these pre-orders reached a set threshold, Ferry started producing the new car in a small factory he purchased back in Porsche's ancestral homeland of Stuttgart. The 356 wasn't a particularly impressive car, but it was the first ever vehicle that Ferdinand, Ferry, and Anton built that would wear the Porsche badge. The company would produce the 356 for 14 years, and use heavily modified versions of the car in auto racing competitions around the world with a good deal of luck. But by the 1960s, nobody was willing to pay more than the price of a Mustang for a car that shared components with a 20-year-old Beetle. To solve this issue, the company went back to the drawing board and designed a more powerful car from the ground up, a car that they dubbed the 901. There was just one problem, and that was that Peugeot had trademarks on the number zero number naming convention. You will see this on Peugeot's models even today. Porsche got around this problem by simply changing the name of the car from 901 to 911. The 911 is today the most well-known Porsche model, and it has been in production in one form or another since it was first introduced in the mid-60s. By 1972, Ferry Porsche had assumed control of the company, but Anton Pieck and his father Ferdinand maintained control of the board. This changed when Ferry learned of Suchiro Honda's policy of no family in the business. Inspired by the company's success, Ferry ousted his father and the co-founder of the business and filled the board with respected business leaders from Germany and abroad. The move was not hostile, and Ferdinand actually used it as an opportunity to start a new venture, Porsche Design, a design company that produces luxury goods like watches, sunglasses, and furniture. Porsche Design remains in operation to this day and is still a large part of the Porsche brand. In the 1970s, the Porsche Group was restructured into a holding company, with Porsche Design, the Porsche Dealership Network, and most importantly, the Porsche Automaker, all held as subsidiaries. The holding company then went public selling shares on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. The Porsche and Pieck family maintained all of the voting power, but the money raised by the IPO was used to further fund development of the car brand as well as make acquisitions into a range of other auto-focused businesses. You probably have come from my video on how money works, so you know that this holding company now acts more like a hedge fund than a car maker with its biggest acquisition to date being the Volkswagen Group that gave it the contract to design its first ever car more than 80 years ago. 
Porsche has had a troubled history, but by being able to adapt to new opportunities and challenges, it navigated its way through some of the most substantial historic events of the last century and continues to operate successfully to this day. Now, to learn about businesses that went in the opposite direction, go and watch my video on the slow downfall of the History Channel to learn how it went from making world-class documentaries to reality TV show garbage. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.